Thank you to our friends at the Corinthia Hotel St. Petersburg for helping us make this episode. We couldn't have done it without their help and support. To book your stay at the incomparable Corinthia St. Petersburg, easily one of the most luxurious hotels that I've ever stayed in, click on the link in the show notes below or visit corinthia.com for more information. This is a city which, to put it bluntly, has seen some shit. The former home of the Tsars and the center of Imperial Russian culture, in its prime, St. Petersburg was known as the Venice of the North. But the 20th century was unbelievably cruel to this city. Bombed, besieged, and starved during World War II, St. Petersburg was neglected during the Soviet era, and large parts of it fell under the control of organized crime. But as Russia began a new chapter in the 1990s, what was once Petrograd and then Leningrad became St. Petersburg again, and the city wasted no time in returning to its former glory. Once again, the most cosmopolitan city in the country, St. Petersburg is the perfect ambassador for Russia's past, present, and future. Petersburg is served by Pulkovo Airport, which is located about 20 kilometers south, served by a variety of regional and international airports. There are currently no American airlines that serve the airport, so if you're coming from the U.S., you would have been transiting. It's a reasonably modern airport. In fact, some of the terminals are almost brand new. There's two layers of security. When you come into the airport, you have to go through an initial screening, and then you have to go through a secondary screening after outbound immigration, so leave enough time. Once you've cleared immigration, and I sincerely hope you've had your visa in order, grabbed your bags and you're ready to go, you have some choices to make. There is no direct train or metro service to or from the airport, but there are a number of buses, and that number is 39. That's your magic number because it's a number for the city bus, the night bus, and the minibus service from this airport into St. Petersburg. The 35-minute journey will cost around 45 rubles. Alternatively, Uber is available from the airport and will cost between 500 and 900 rubles depending on which part of the city you're heading to. Taxis can be booked from the service booth in the arrival hall, and fares are fixed depending on the area of the city you're traveling to, but you'll pay between 1,000 and 1,500 rubles including a booking fee. We all have our favorite forms of transport, every traveler does. Mine is the simple elegance of a mid-century metropolitan tram while Greg likes to float around cities on a chrome Segway. However, I'd like to submit for your consideration your new favorite form of transport, the St. Petersburg Metro. Rare amongst all the cities I have ever visited is a public transport system, a destination in and of itself. The second largest metro system in Russia, the St. Petersburg Metro, is quite literally a work of art. But this isn't just a looker. The system is efficient, cheap, and functional, and a great way to get around the city. Any trip on the metro, regardless of the distance you're traveling, costs 45 rubles. You'll get one of these nifty little brass tokens that you can slot into the turnstile and you're on your way. Alternatively, you can, and I recommend this, get a 10 trip pass for 355 rubles. You can grab one at the ticket machines in the station or for one of the ticket kiosks. One final nugget about the metro system, due to the city's unique geology, it's actually the deepest metro system in the world. On average, the stations are 85 meters below the surface. And once you set aside the factor, it makes for some long walks from turnstile to train, so plan for that. They're not kidding about the deepness. A quick word on taxis, if I may. In Russia, every single car is a potential taxi. Flagging down a private vehicle, paying for a ride somewhere, is perfectly normal in Russia. But I don't recommend it for a couple of reasons. Firstly, language. While more people speak English than in any other city in Russia, it's still not universally adopted. So you may be able to get a taxi, but telling the person where you want to go, that's a different story. The second thing, of course, is safety. It's never a good idea to get into a random person's car in any city in the world. So if you want to take a taxi, take an official taxi. But a couple of tips for that as well. Negotiate your fare before you begin your journey. And although it may go against everything we've ever told you in every other city that we've covered, if a driver insists on using the meter, find another driver. 
always negotiate your fare before you start your journey. Perhaps a safer and frankly easier alternative is Uber, which has extensive service throughout the city. Now, your driver may not speak English and you may not speak a lick of Russian, but the app will pick up the slack and get you from point A to point B without any problems. Russian food, just like Russia itself, has a rich and storied history. But it is a rare treat, among all the cities that we've been to, to be able to experience the hospitality of another time, another era. I feel like we've gone back in, in time a little bit. What, what is this place? Nice to hear it, <laughs> because that's the emotion that we're supposed to have from our guests. Because, yeah, really, it's a place of Soviet times. There is no politics here, it's just things and artifacts that should remind you about uh, the Soviet times and all the good things and good feelings that you have at uh, that time. And the food and the atmosphere, uh, the interior, everything is just like you get back in time. The restaurant serves up healthy portions of Russian nostalgia. Classic soup dishes like borscht and the incomparable salanka were followed by dishes that were, frankly, entirely new experiences for me. This one is herring is under fur coat. Quite strange <laughs> name, yeah. Herring uh, under fur coat. Under fur wow. coat, yeah. On the bottom there is a herring and then layers by layers mm -hmm. you have vegetables and mayonnaise and egg on the top. Dish after dish, discovery after discovery, we transition from savory to sweet with the help of some traditional tea served in a beautiful Russian samovar. That was amazing, but now I need a very, very, very long nap. But, dear viewer, we are just beginning our St. Petersburg food adventure. So I decided to ask our friend Anna Chernova from the outstanding Corinthia Hotel team for some guidance. We don't always have the opportunity to talk to a local when we do these episodes. So whenever we do, I grab the opportunity, which is why I'm very excited that we have Anna, who was born and raised in St. Petersburg and has basically making sure that Greg and I don't get into trouble while we've been here and has pointed us in every single direction that we need to go. It's been wonderful. But I always have one question for you. What is that one food that you must eat in St. Petersburg? One food, it's one food. so difficult actually because um, the Russian cuisine has very long history and it was changing through the whole history and it's difficult to pick up one, but I probably would highly recommend smelt fish. It's very small fish, we will try it later. All right. <laughs> it's very small fish and it swims only in the River Niva, which is uh, in the St. Petersburg. So it's a very, very unique fish. It has a bit strange smell. It smells like a cucumber when it's fresh and it's absolutely amazing when it's uh, fried. Everything yeah. is amazing when it's fried. Yes, it is. <laughs> if you're coming to St. Petersburg, you have to try smelt fish. And if you're gonna try smelt fish, you have to try it here, Ginza Project, on the banks of the Bolshia Nevka River. Oh. So good, it's like giant white bait. You've eaten a hundred tiny fish and you're still hungry? Fear not. Like the rest of the world, street food is all over St. Petersburg. And what better way to experience a city's street food culture than with that global street food staple, shawarma. There is something wonderful about the universality of shawarma. It has gone to every corner of the earth. The core ingredients remain the same, pretty much, which is meat, some kind of sauce, maybe a vegetable, in a wrap. No matter where you go in the world, the ingredients do stay the same, but there is a different take on it, and it's adopted into local street food culture. This is a Russian sparma burrito, as far as I'm concerned, right? No. No, it is. I'm going to eat it now. <laughs> it's good. But there remains a Russian staple that we have yet to experience, a classic so intertwined with Russia's identity that it's impossible to imagine one without the other, vodka. The Russian Vodka Museum tells the story of this quintessentially Russian libation. From its humble beginnings as the spoils of a botched religious mission, to its curious and ancient, and sometimes a little sadistic rituals. And once you have learned about vodka, it's time to drink vodka. Although, as we discovered, it's a little more complicated than that. Three different types of vodka. 
uh, and I'm, I'm to inhale out, inhale out, boosh, I believe the pronunciation is, and then eat something. You said don't uh, go slowly, otherwise it hurts. Oh, it's very smooth. <laughs> Being the pragmatic people they are, Russians encourage a little lining of the stomach while you enjoy their national drink. Things like lard with mustard or herring served on rye bread usually do the trick. That's good. I love mustard. Perfecting a smooth vodka requires unlikely but effective ingredients. Smooth water from the North Mountains and deer antlers to purify them. This is the most vodka I have drunk in my entire life, perhaps. The museum is housed in the Stroganov buildings. Yes, that Stroganov. I'm eating beef Stroganov where it was invented. We're actually in the Stroganov complex. And here it is. Oh. Onions, sour cream. Could there be a more beautiful combination? Our waiter, Leonid, suggested that perhaps there was. When, the, when they were forbidden for drinking vodka, they would order this dish. There was no bottles, no shot glasses, no sign of drinking the vodka, but of course the vodka was there and it was mixed in, and it would have the uh, desired effect, if you will. And they would order it again and again and again. I am very sure we learned a lot about vodka, about stroganoff, about Russia that night. If only we could remember it. Another day dawns in St. Petersburg and our trusted Sherpa Anna suggests she might know something that could cure what ails us on this, the day after the night before. I'm a fan of just about every fried batter product there is. I'm on a mission in life to try every single one of them, but I think this is my new favorite. The beautiful Pishki. Can I say that right, Anna? Yeah, all right, good. It seems a lot harder than it should be. Uh, it's a really light, fluffy dough that's then deep fried in extremely hot oil, not for very long, and then sprinkled with powdered sugar. It is a wonderfully St. Petersburg treat. You, you try and get these anywhere outside of St. Petersburg, the recipe changes, the topping changes, the technique changes. So this is really something you can only get here, and they are wonderful. I'm going to eat one, and it eats regularly six, apparently. Six seems unhealthy, but I can see why. They are wonderful. Before we get into the specifics on money, a quick general note on currency and exchange rates. In the first few episodes of this show, we would talk in specifics about exchange rates and currencies and say something cost X and then convert that into another kind of currency. We stopped doing that. Ever since Brexit and Trump and general financial market instability, exchange rates have been all over the place. So even just days after filming, the stuff we put in an episode was out of date. And we'd get the inevitable YouTube comments of, one pound isn't a dollar seven to you absolute numpty. And that hurts. It hurts me and it hurts Greg. So we stopped doing it. Instead, you can use one of the many wonderful currency conversion tools that are out there or try this new thing called Google. I've heard it's very good. For the longest time, Russia has used the ruble, or various incarnations thereof, as its currency. The current version is from 1998 onwards. Any coin or note before that is no longer legal tender. Now, a ruble is made up of 100 kopecks, but because of the value of the ruble as it is today, it is extremely rare to see prices reference kopecks. Everything is rounded up to the nearest ruble. And even one and five, and now even 10 ruble coins are of such little value that you rarely see them. Everything is moving to notes now. Five and 10 ruble notes are slowly going out of production as well. And while you can have a huge stack of notes in your pocket, it's not actually that much money. But St. Petersburg, like a lot of Russia, is a pretty cheap city. Yes, luxury goods and high-end food like caviar will cost a lot of money no matter where you are, but you can eat and drink and get around in this city incredibly cheaply. And it's all of excellent quality if you're looking in the right places.
Very quick chat about tipping. In the past, it was generally frowned upon, but it's actually coming into fashion uh, in the last few years. But it's very, very simple. 10% is more than enough in a satisfactory restaurant or bar experience, and you can round up the change in a taxi or other service environment. Visa and MasterCard debit and credit cards are widely accepted, even in the smallest of shops. American Express, not so much. I saw a sign that said it, my card would work and it did not. So your mileage may vary, but Visa and MasterCard accept it everywhere. There are ATMs everywhere. Some will charge a fee and some won't. So make sure you check that before you begin your transaction. And with that in mind, let's do the rundown. A cup of coffee will cost you around 200 rubles. A pint of beer will cost you 175 rubles. And for the most reliable indicator of a nation's cost, the good old Big Mac, you're going to pay about 137 rubles. The St. Petersburg a safe city? Absolutely. Russian cities are saddled with this inaccurate and unfair reputation as being generally unsafe. That is an unfair characterization. Yes, there was a terror attack on the metro here earlier this year, there's no denying that, but that was an isolated incident and should in no way put you off coming to this city or any other Russian city, or even more importantly, exploring on your own. At no point during our stay here have we felt unsafe wandering and exploring the city during the day or during the night. This is a safe city. This was my first experience of Russia, and I will admit, I arrived with more than a few preconceptions. But after spending time here, I can say that every illusion I had of what this place might be like was shattered, and I have come away with limitless appreciation for this city and for this country. Yes, St. Petersburg has history and culture in abundance. Of this it is and should be proud. But behind the ornate facades, there's real depth, real people, real Russia. I will, I have no doubt, be back.